Thank you all very much for joining us today. I'm Mats Licht, Deputy Editor of Interviews with the Oxford Political Review. And uh, we are very honored to be joined today by Dr. Karl Hart, the Ziff Professor of Psychology at Columbia University in New York, where he has been teaching since 1998. His work focuses on behavioral neuroscience and neuropsychopharmacology, and, stu and it studies the behavioral and neuropharmacological effects on psychoactive drugs in humans. He has authored and co-authored many scientific articles about his lab work, especially assessing the cognitive function of long-term users of different drugs, but he has also published peer-reviewed articles on the social effects of substance legislation, and particularly on the racist legacy of drug prohibition laws in the United States. He is also the co-author of Drug Society and Human Behavior, which is a market-leading introductory textbook on the topic that is used in university courses worldwide. Dr. Hart has also commented on drug legislation in the context of current events, for example, during the trial of George Zimmerman in 2013, uh, for media outlets like the New York Times and CNN. He's also released two popular scientific and autobiographical books, with the latest called Drug Use for Grown-Ups, Chasing Liberty in the Land of Fear, coming out just a few weeks ago. In these books, Dr. Hart comes out as an outspoken advocate for the decriminalization and even legalization of all psychoactive substances. So welcome, and thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us today, Dr. Hart. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Great. So maybe let's start with something topical. Um, so we have just witnessed over the past year or so perhaps the most profound state intervention in the interest of public health in probably human history. How would you say the pandemic reflects on your work and what some might call your activism? Um, I don't know, really. Um, it doesn't really impact upon my work. Um, it just, I mean, we, we uh, were, like everyone else, shut down, so we couldn't do research studies. Um, the, the results of the pandemic, uh, lots of people dying, particularly poor people uh, or people with limited resources, uh, we have known that for some time. Um, uh, now, more of the world understands uh, the consequences of not taking care of people in your society. Right. That, that actually is what I was aiming at, I suppose. The increased focus on public health that this has drawn. Generally, do you see that there is more attention to, to the issue now? I, I don't know if this is an uh, an increased focus on public health. I, I, I don't I, I don't know that's how it, I don't know if that's how I would think about this. Uh, what it, what it says to me is that we need to make sure that people have access to health care. We need to make sure that people have access to uh, healthy diets, foods, exercise. Uh, uh, we need to make sure people are gainfully employed. I mean, that's what it says to me. Uh, public health is too small uh, for uh, if we're thinking about solving the problems that people face. Public health is not the place. That's the, they are too limited, too narrowly focused and not uh, equipped enough that nor is like any particular branch of science uh, this is like this is much more um uh incumbent uh it well it, it it encumbers more of um uh more than just public health or any area uh, it requires a broader sort of intervention mm. but i mean it has opened the gates for massive government intervention maybe even in the United States, where that would traditionally be be something that the government would be reluctant to do, no? Well, you will have to tell me where it has opened the gates and what has done, what has resulted from that, because I, I haven't seen much activity as a result of this. I mean, besides making sure everyone has the vaccine. Uh, beyond that, uh, maybe you can help me understand uh, <laughs> Have there been more jobs given to people that, uh, that I mean, gainfully employed uh, jobs, jobs that pay middle class wages? I don't think that has happened. Uh, there hasn't been increased access to health care, uh, certainly not in this country. Uh, so I don't I don't know what you're talking about, really. <laughs> I'm happy to be corrected. Um... There is, however, something that I am personally, I think I saw coming out of this, which has to do with the communication of science to large groups or the population at large. And in a sense, I can't help but think that what you're trying to do, particularly with your more popular books, the latest one coming out just now, 
um, is quite similar in intention. So you also appear to be trying to educate people on the real science, let's call it that, behind um, an issue that is very much in the foreground of many people's perception of the world. And yet you say essentially that what people understand about drug legislation, about the way that drugs work um, is just wrong and does not, is not actually supported by science. Um, I feel, maybe let me rephrase my initial question, that during the pandemic as well, a lot of science has been communicated to the people, but with very varying results. And lots of people have been um, discussing these results as well. Uh, I'm not really sure what you're asking. Um, when we think about um, COVID-19 and this pandemic, there are there is there are many conflicting sort of views and points of view uh, on the subject um and uh, when we say look to the science um i don't know exactly what people are looking what they're seeing when they look to the science with COVID 19 i'm not an expert there uh just in our country trying to get people to be vaccinated there are a number of people who won't become, will not get vaccin vaccinated because they don't believe whatever the science is that is being presented to them in support of vaccinations. So uh, there's not a consensus. Um, uh, uh, I mean, I know that I got vaccinated because I, because of how I interpreted the, the science and so, but there are a number of people who have uh, scientists who they think um, who who suggest to them that they shouldn't get vaccinated. So I I I don't really know enough about uh, the virus uh, to be commenting on the virus from that perspective. I can only tell you what I did. But in terms of drug related science, um, uh, I know quite a bit about this. And uh, and even still, when I what I am saying, there are people who who are scientists who say otherwise. And so if you, we want to get into like where the differences are, whether it's with the results or whether it's with the interpretations, we can do that. But I, I can't I can't really speak to COVID-19 like that because I I'm, I'm ignorant. I would be out of my depths and it's not fair. Of course. I, I'm sorry if, if, I, if my question was phrased uh ambiguously there. I didn't, I didn't want to put you on the spot commenting on COVID. I actually, um, on the topic where you are very much in your field, which is, which is like you mentioned, is research on, on psychoactive substances, though, from reading your particularly more popular works, it does seem like scientific communication in the field is quite divorced from the reality of what people like you are actually seeing in the laboratories. Um, so why, why, why is that, in your opinion? Well, because when we talk about drugs, there is a moralistic component associated with drug use. And that moralistic component, I think, sometimes blind, even scientists. Uh, and that moralistic component is, is related to the fact that there are people in our society who don't think people should be able to take a substance and feel good, uh, feel euphoric, and alter their consciousness. Um, there are people who actually think that way in our society. Whereas when you come at it from perspective of, wait a second, um, that's not my job to tell people what they can and cannot do. My job is to try to provide the best available information. If you're doing that, then you have to fall on the side of where I'm at with, with this substance, what I mean with this issue. Uh, and so I try to stick as closely as I can to the scientific data and I try to give people um, uh, the information accordingly. Right. Um, you say it's, it's your job only to present the most accurate version of scientific data and yet you, you publish books that I think, correct me if I'm wrong, quite clearly have an, have an agenda. So you, you clearly think that there is, that you have a certain obligation, no? No, you're absolutely right. Um, 
everything that anybody writes, there is an agenda. Absolutely. My agenda is to increase the, the public education around the, subs, uh, around the subject and also uh, to try to make sure that people are not being taken advantage of as a result of my area, my expertise or anything uh, related. So, yeah, you're right. My agenda is like it, when it comes to drugs, I think that we are regulating them uh, in a way that is overly harsh and in a way that uh, disproportionately uh, negatively impact poor people, people of color. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I have to speak out against that sort of thing. And I uh, advocate for doing things differently. You're absolutely right. Hmm. I, I find this dichotomy, or let's not call it a dichotomy, just this, the, well, these two aspects of your work quite interesting, to be honest, because on the one hand, you focus on the misrepresentation of scientific results by certain actors in the scientific community. Um, uh, and you, you call out their use of what you call anecdotal evidence. And yet, on the other hand, you have this very powerful personal story that, without trying to discredit it or anything, relies very heavily on anecdotal evidence, I would say. You describe uh, your own childhood, you describe the communities you grew up in, you describe the descent of friends and family of yours into, well, becoming essentially victims of, of a criminal justice system, as you describe. Um, how, how do you see these, these two narratives kind of working together? Well, when I use anecdotal information, um, it's always in, in the service of the actual data. It's always uh, to illustrate uh, a scientific sort of uh, uh, truism. Um, so I may present the data or the study beforehand, and then I may use an anecdote, uh, anecdotal story experience to um, help the reader remember that the scientific truism. Um, and so I try not to give anecdotes that are just alone uh, for the sake of giving an anecdote to prove a point. I try not to do that. Uh, but if you're going to tell an, an engaging story, you have to uh, humanize the story. And one way that I humanize my stories uh, is to um, infuse or interject my personal story. Of course, no, that, that makes a tremendous amount of sense, particularly since it is an issue that affects real people. So, um, no, it, it, it's a very powerful story, honestly. I mean, particularly your 2013 book, it, it, it read ve very much like one of those classic novels, let's say someone like Maya Angelou, for example, which is very interesting to me because not being from the US um, and you being quite a bit younger than her, perhaps, it seems like the milieu that you both describe, uh, it hasn't changed profoundly. No, it hasn't. It, uh, you know, Maya Angelou is relatively contemporary. Uh, you can go back to James Baldwin and you can go back uh, to uh, Du Bois before him. You can just, you can continuously go back and the milieu hasn't changed much. Uh, and uh, it says a lot about who we are as Americans. And I don't think it will change much because capitalism really doesn't care about poor people. And so I think that that's one of the things that is uh, uh, operating here. And I'm trying to show people how the, the issue of drugs uh, has been used to keep that milieu uh, 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 from changing. Uh, mm -hmm. The same people who are catching hell uh, now were the same people who were catching hell 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 60 years ago. It's the same people. And drugs are ideal tools to make sure that things don't change in that regard. Right. That's true. I mean, you describe kind of a, a sequence of waves or cycles that you that kind of form the same that, that come from the same pattern where there is a moral panic about a specific substance usually something new there is a legal overreaction which then in turn deepens the sort of crisis and then precipitates the reappearance of the next wave so um, you mentioned opium after the civil war uh, cocaine in the 1930s um, the, in the prohibition in the prohibition south particularly heroin in the 60s crack cocaine in the 80s um, and every single one, like you describe it, seems to characterize drug users more or less 
in the same broad strokes, which is as menacing, at best maybe pitiful, usually non-white men. Uh, yes. But you also describe or you talk about the what you call the so-called opioid epidemic, and where you where you talk about how this focus has slightly shifted. Is is this different from any of these uh, from these cycles that you described before? No, I tried to make it clear that what we're seeing with opioids today is similar to what we saw with opioids in the 60s and the 70s and before. Uh, we were all, uh, we were all, we have always been more sympathetic towards uh, white middle class users than we have been towards uh, poor people and brown people. Uh, we've always we've always behaved this this way, and some people say, "Oh, we now care about drug uh, drug users now that there are white people, middle class folks who are addicted to opioids. We now care." as if that's new, that's not new. It's always has been that way. Uh, we've always operated in the way, in that way where treatment for some, the sort of poor uh, middle-class white folks and then uh, jail for others, the black and brown and poor people, you go to jail. We've always done that sort of thing. So this isn't new. Um, it's, it's the same pattern that we have uh, uh, seen in, in the past. Mm. So is there any way that this process can change? I mean, even with the opioid epidemic, even if some people were to say that there is more sympathy now because it talks about white people, then again, consider, for example, the, the rhetoric about fentanyl uh, during the, in, in the reporting on the, on the uh, George Floyd case. Can this ever change or is the cycle just doomed to repeat itself? It certainly can change. if. Um large numbers of white Americans um, stand up and say that this is wrong. It, it can change. It can change if our uh, media uh, uh, personnel, the folks who write these stories, these reporters, uh, people who make documentary films, uh, if they do a better job, this could change. But too often those people are the people who make uh, documentary films and, and, and also television programs, also who write uh, uh, stories in our newspapers, all of these people are typically middle to upper class folks and typically white. Um, and so they are the ones who tell these awful stories that are wrong typically about drugs. And they are the ones that kind of perpetuate this nonsense about drugs. So until they get it right, we will. We are doomed to repeat this sort of pattern, um, and uh, and that's what I try to point out in the book. It's like these are the people who are getting it wrong, and, and scientists as well. Scientists mm -hmm. participate in this as well because uh, all of these people that I named. I mean, everyone knows about law enforcement participation. I mean, they're getting the bulk of the money from the war on drugs. But the law enforcement personnel are not the ones that are shaping public opinion. Mm. It's the newspaper reporters. It's the documentary filmmakers. It's the TV uh, producers and, and writers for TV program. It's the scientists. They're shaping public opinion until they get it right. These folks who are typically the privileged of our society, until they get it right, we are doomed to repeat these patterns. That's one of the reasons that I wrote the book, to show people how we get hoodwinked. Mm. So how do you think this can change? How, do, how, can, how can these middle-class, influential, primarily white people be induced to change, to use their power to change the narrative that they're already creating? You mentioned you wrote this book, but um, if you're the only one, can it still happen? Um, I don't, I don't know, you know, I have to behave like it's, it still can happen. Otherwise, I will become too depressed and I would just give up and I can't do that. Um, so I don't know, but I have to behave as though it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and when I think about the incentives that these people have, the incentives are all in the way, uh, all in in the service of exaggerating these harmful effects. That's where all of the incentives are. Um, and so it, that's a bit discouraging. Uh, I wrote the book to help people to see who's really responsible for uh, the suffering 
Um, and so hopefully other people put pressure on those groups that I name. Yeah, you mentioned particularly um, your fellow scientists. So I am actually quite interested to know if you are alone amongst your peers in, I, I mean, I assume you're not, the, you're not alone in holding the views that you hold, um, but why, why you seemingly are alone in speaking out about them and in being so open also about your own experiences? Well, so um, I'm a Black American, of course, and you, if you know anything about the history of our country and the current the present day, you know, Black people are catching hell in the U.S. Uh, just as a group in general. And uh, that's my people, my relatives, my, my kids, uh, uh, my father, his father, catching hell. And so if I see some sort of, some reason, some mechanism for this hell, I have to say something because I don't want my people to suffer. Uh, the sort of white middle-class people don't have the same sort of skin in the game. And so they don't have the same sort of concerns that I have. And as a result, we see their uh, silence on this issue. Uh, we see um, uh, how they have been ambivalent in terms of speaking out. Uh, it's not right. It's cowardly. And it, it's also, it uh, goes against the principles of being a, a humanitarian when you see this kind of suffering. Now, people have, they, they justify it, or they rationalize it by, with all kinds of rationalizations, and we can get into some of those rationalizations, but the facts remain. We have exaggerated the harmful effects of drugs. We have simply done that, and our regulation of these drugs disproportionately punishes uh, certain segments of our society, and that's not right. That, those are the facts. Right. So you... You mentioned, I mean, that you, obviously this is a personal issue to you. You just said so, and, and that is that is certainly true. It's a very, it's, you have a very powerful story yourself. Um, but you, not but you compare the your speaking out in in your latest book. You use the term coming out of the closet about your own drug use as well. Um, and please stop me if you if you don't want to talk about that. But uh, wh why did you use that metaphor? Well, so as you know, um, uh, uh, at the end of the book, the, I, uh, I answered a question like, what can you do as a public? What can just the regular folk do? And one of the things that I ask people to do is to come out of the closet about their own drug use. Um, now, I, I recognize that the people who are more likely to read the book are like middle class people. And so that's who I'm talking to. Now, those people are responsible. Uh, they take they take care of their family. They keep they take care of their responsibilities. Those are upstanding citizens. They pay taxes. They these are the people that we want uh, people to emulate. Uh, and but yet a large proportion of these people use drugs and they're in the closet. And so I asked them to come out of the closet in order to help to change the narrative around what we think of as a typical drug user. We don't typically think of a typical drug user as being responsible uh, and upstanding citizen in our society, but that's the fact. Those are the facts. They are. And so if I'm going to ask people to come out of the closet, then I too myself have to be an example. And so that's the only reason that I came out of the closet because I wanted people to see like, this is my example. I don't only, I, I actually uh, I behave as I asked you to behave. I, I won't ask you to do something that I'm not willing to do. Uh, and so um, I, I would not have been able to ask people to come out of the closet if I didn't do the same. Um, and also, just as a scientist, I want people to understand, as a scientist in this area, I have actually taken most of these drugs that we talk about. And I want people to know that I know something about drugs from the scientific laboratory to the sort of to my personal sort of space at home. I know about these drugs. I mean, I certainly, on a personal note, really appreciate it. I mean, these sorts of messages, I would have certainly appreciated them at an earlier point in my life as well. You know, if we all go through these situations where we wonder, is it true what people say about the things we like to do? 
Um, so yeah, it's quite brave, I must say, especially given, like you say, your situation, you are a black man in America, you are part of that history, you are part, you, you are from a community that has in the eyes of the mainstream narrative been ravaged by drugs, if you want to use their sort of sort of rhetoric, which personally I don't believe in at all either. But um, don't you feel repercussions for you and for your cause in being so candid about coming out of the closet, like you say? Well, you know, I knew there would be repercussions for me, right? And, and so, um, which is unfortunate, but it is it's how it has to be. I have to be as honest as I possibly can be to the public. That's all I can do, you know, about the repercussions. You're right there. There will be repercussions. And that's but I, I, I don't have any control over that. You know, I think that it's wrong to, for there to be repercussions. And I will speak out against that. But I, I can't control it mm -hmm. now in terms of repercussions for the cause. I actually don't think there will be for the cause. Um, and if there are, I guess we would just have to deal with it because um, all I'm trying to show people is like, it's that your view of what a drug user is like is wrong. I mean, I've been doing this, this activity for 10, 10, 15 years, and I've been publishing more than most of the people in science, more than most of academics. Uh, I've traveled around the world and, and, and spoken to people about these things. I've written books. What more can you ask of a human? I take care of my family. My kids are college educated. What more can you ask of someone? That's certainly true. It's certainly true. But like you describe, I mean, the narrative isn't necessarily rational, is it? You're absolutely right. And um, uh, when we when, when we know that a narrative is not rational, you can't really predict where in what direction it's going to go. And so all you can do is control your own actions. And my actions tell me that uh, I have to do what's right. I mean, even if I am vilified or persecuted by in this current sort of moment. So, so it is, I will, uh, history will vindicate me. I am certain of that. I, I am sure, I am sure. If it, I mean, if it shouldn't have to vindicate you, honestly, but I'm sure. Um, right, um, you were talking about the incentives also for scientists and media producers to report in the status quo narrative to vilify drugs and to kind of silence voices such as yours and silence the voice of results um, from research such as yours. Um, could, you, could you maybe go through a few of those or what you view as the incentives for them to act in the way they do? Yeah, so if we take a step back, if we will, um, when we think about funding for the science in this area, for drug abuse science, as they, they call it, uh, more than 80, 90 percent of the world's research is funded uh, by the National Institute on Drug Abuse in the U.S., uh, so that's a huge amount of funding for this area. So it's an outside sort of influence that the National Institute on Drug Abuse has on this area. Now, the mission of the National Institute, of the National Institute on Drug Abuse has been for since their inception for most of that, that agency sort of life has been to focus on the negative effects of these drugs. And so that means that people who are writing grants um, that are submitted to this, uh, for this organization, their grants, have, their applications have to focus on the negative impact of drugs. And that's what they do. So they are incentivized to focus on the, on the negative effects of drugs. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're incentivized to study the negative effects of drugs, guess what you're going to find? Guess what you're going to report? And so that's what has happened with this field. Uh, we just been in incentivized to focus on the negative effects, not the comprehensive sort of effects of drugs, but the negative effects. Uh, and then 
that means that what gets published in the scientific literature is primarily the negative effects. What gets published in the textbooks, primarily the negative effects. And then what's, what's, what gets published in our newspapers, um, what gets shown in documentary films will be primarily the negative effects. So it all flows from the science. So people can say, I'm being consistent with the science. But as you see, if you start with the science in a biased place, then what you're going to find are biased results and then the interpretations uh, in the popular sort of media, the popular uh, mainstream will be uh, on these negative effects. Um, that's why people don't know basic things about drugs, like just this basic lesson. The vast majority of people who use any drugs, including cocaine, heroin, marijuana, you name it, the vast majority of users of any of those drugs are not addicted. The overwhelming majority of the users of any of those drugs are not addicted and they won't meet criteria for addiction. That's a basic sort of finding we've known for many decades. But people don't know it because we don't talk about it because we're not incentivized to talk about that. Mm. So you, you mentioned, for example, also in your books that the National Institute on Drug Abuse um, and particularly the chairperson of that institute, um, they hold on to the brain disease model of addiction. So if you could just briefly summarize what it is and why is it wrong? Yeah, the brain disease model of addiction basically says that use of these drugs, cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, the use of these recreational drugs uh, will cause a brain disease or people who are addicted to drugs have a brain disease. Now, when I say, uh, I, want, I take exception uh, 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 to that sort of uh, statement because there is currently no evidence in humans to show that people who have an addiction to one of these substances has brain disease. There's just no evidence in humans to support that statement, that theory, that supposition. There is no data in hum humans to support that. And one of the things that I did in the, tech, in the book was I tried to show the reader how the reader gets fooled with uh, neural imaging data, for example. Like someone will put up a slide of a brain image. Uh, they'll say, hey, okay, these are methamphetamine users on this side, and we have uh, the control groups who didn't use methamphetamine on this side. So you have these different groups on different sides, and you might see some brain difference between the two groups. I don't know, you might see in the methamphetamine users, you might see that they have a smaller region of the cortex in some structure, then they, they're, they're, that region in their brain is smaller than that is that which is seen in the controls. Now, people may interpret that as saying, see, methamphetamine caused this difference. Now, that would be inappropriate in most cases because in most cases, you only take an image of people's brain one moment in time. So you don't know what was there before the methamphetamine use began. That's number one. So you can't say that methamphetamine caused that. Another concern there is that we have uh, our brain sizes vary widely within our population. So what is normal for you may be different for, for me. That's just like with height. We have different heights in a society. Um, I'm five feet, 10 inches. Somebody else might be six feet. But we wouldn't say that I am height deficient as if I had some um, uh, abnormality, but that's what we do with these brain imaging um, uh, findings, as opposed to looking at the structure along with the function. So if you see that the smaller structure is not allowing the person to accomplish some cognitive function, like they should be uh, accomplishing that function, uh, then we can say there is a dysfunction. We might be able to say it at that point, but they don't do that. They don't make, they don't uh, match this to a, a functional sort of output or functional uh, uh, out point, I should say. Mm. And, and you in your research, you investigated that. Yes. And so I, I, I published uh, 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 one review paper in 2012 where I really looked at the data 
uh, of all of these studies that have claimed to have some brain dysfunction or brain abnormality. And uh, I pointed out that when you control for people's age and education, even methamphetamine users, uh, they perform within the normal range uh, of, of when you correct for their age and education. So they are, their brain functioning is normal. Hmm. But aren't you, some might say, by throwing out this um, brain disease model, which is championed by people like, like Nora Volkow, um, aren't you kind of risking going back to the idea that drug use is just a sort of individual moral failing? Um, I don't know exactly how I would be risking that when I'm simply saying that the data does not say what they have said it shows that this is a brain disease. Um, and my goal is not to say, well, I need to say this so you don't say that. That's not the goal here. Um, um, uh, drug addiction, of course, is not a moral failing. And when we look at the criteria by which we judge whether someone uh, meets criteria for a drug addiction, uh, it has to do with, it doesn't have anything to do with morals. The, we're looking at these behaviors. So if someone says that it's a moral failing, um, uh, they're just wrong. Uh, so I don't, I don't, I don't understand, um, um, that perspective, uh, like me pointing out that there is no evidence to, to support the notion that drug addiction is a brain disease. I don't understand how that then leads someone to say that, well, you, now you're opening yourself up to say that mm. these people are, they just simply have a moral failing. And all they need to do is buckle down and stop using drugs. Like, that's not what I'm saying. In fact, I have said that, you know, drug use in many cases is, is rational. Um, and, and so the only people who would say that it's a moral failing are those people who don't understand why people take drugs. And it's really, a, it's simple to understand why people take drugs. Hell, drugs work to produce pleasure, euphoria, all of these pro-social behaviors that we want. That's why people take drugs. Hmm. I was I, I didn't mean to imply that that's what you were saying I was I was referring to the fact that people like like Nora Volkov specifically very frequently in her public appearances starts off by framing her research um, as overcoming the idea that drug abuse is is a moral failing that's that's what no I I, I understood where you were going and I, I and I appreciate the question because I, it's a question that people will ask. And I knew where you were coming from. I knew it was in response to her work because um, the way you just put it really highlights how ridiculous that comment is. So that that's a good sort of point that you make. Um, in, in that context, I know, so, so Nora Volkov also calls um, addiction a disease of free will. Um, and I feel like that is quite in, contrast to to most of your writing because you say explicitly that especially your latest book is for um, autonomous responsible well-functioning and healthy adults so i just want to ask you, do you is it realistic to expect your readers to be these responsible and adult people <laughs> well <laughs> I, I i should like one of the things that i hope people understand is that uh, being responsible and all of those things, like being a grown up, it, it's not a static process. I mean, it is a dynamic process. And we, on some days, we're better than we are on other days. And it requires constant work. Um, you know, in the book, I try to explain, uh, particularly in the opioid chapter, how it, it requires a responsible person, it requires you to constantly evaluate and reevaluate the impact of your behavior on others to make sure that you're not negatively impacting those people. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a constant struggle and your question is well taken um, because we are not always responsible and uh, humans are not always rational either. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the point is, is that uh, most of us, most of the time, when it comes to this area, are, 
are highly responsible because we think of you think about it it's an illegal behavior in mo many places and if people engage in it it requires a lot of planning and responsibility so you don't run afoul of the law i mean uh and and so uh i think most people are quite responsible mm. then again you describe especially in, 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 in your 2013 book, very much kind of the external factors that make people act in certain ways and to lose the ability to think critically, like you say. So how can we actually form a society or expect a society to produce people who are capable of reflecting on their behavior in that way so that their behavior is not damaging to others? Um, that's a great question. Um, one of the things that I'm trying to do with my work, I'm trying to uh, remind people that it, it's our responsibility to look after other people, to make sure that those people's rights are protected. So if we all want our rights to be respected, then we have to protect the rights of other people. Uh, and I'm also trying to help people to understand that it's part of our responsibility as being citizens in uh, these sort of wealthy societies, part of our responsibility is also to ensure that we have safety nets for people who are not doing so well. And so we have to make sure we're treating them well. And if we're, if we're, if we're modeling this type of behavior, then hopefully other folks will emulate this behavior. And uh, so uh, your point is well taken. It's a difficult thing but we start with by treating people better. Right. So in that sense, it would be an issue about the role of the government and government intervention. Yes, and the government is made up of people like you and me. And so I am speaking to people like you and me uh, because it's so easy to hide behind this big nebulous thing called the government. But ultimately the government is made up of people and we have to hold those people accountable. That means I have to be better. If I'm going to hold you accountable, then I have to be better. I cannot require something of you that I'm not doing myself. That, that is true. I, I, I would hope that governments were made up of people like you, uh, perhaps me in the future, who knows. Um, but I mean, realistically at the moment, would you say they are? Um, no, um, I will say that there are some really decent people in government, and then there are some powerful forces that try to ensure that those people hide their decency, mm -hmm. so that those people uh, somehow suppress their decency. Uh, but it's incumbent upon people like me and other folks to uh, remind uh, the people in government, that they are there in order to serve the people and not the other way around. Mm -hmm. And you, your point is well taken. That oftentimes get lost. And um, like I do not talk to politicians very often because um, they don't really care. They only care about what voters are going to say. And so I'm trying to talk to their voters. And if I can get their voters to... Uh, uh, understand the issue in a certain way, then the politician will have to go along with their voters. Hmm. I mean, we can hope that maybe some politicians will also read your book. I mean, it is it is uh, being being publicized quite well. Um, well, you know, our vice president, our Madam Vice President uh, Kamala Harris, she and I, we both have the same editor, and so um, maybe. Um, my editor would get her a copy of the book. Uh, that, that, that would be great. I mean, she used to be in law enforcement. She's probably familiar with a lot of the issues you describe. She says she is, yes. <laughs> what do you think then the aim of people in the government, but maybe that's a bit too, too far-fetched, but what, is, what do they want to, what does, the, what, what does current substance legislation want to achieve? for the people? Why do they keep it up, even if they are decent, even if the science is against it, even if opinions like yours are so well publicized, even if the damage is evident? 
Well, I think the government in general um, has operated for many years under the sort of notion of uh, Puritanism, Puritan, Puritan, how do we say that? Puritanical sort of approaches. Everyone That's the way. I'm sorry. Everyone knows what the word you wanted to. Yeah. Yes, and so they that this sort of puritanical sort of way of seeing drugs has uh, has influenced our policies, and this puritanical way of seeing drugs is simply this. Um, people shouldn't uh, um, enjoy themselves unless they have earned that enjoyment, which is silly. You know, it's a whole as a silly concept, uh, and so we have to get the people in government to understand that if people are euphoric and happy and open and uh, magnanimous just because they talk a substance. Uh, it means that those per those people are more likely to treat other people well, to treat other people better. And that's a good thing. So we want people to be happy. Um, uh, as, as long as they are not uh, negatively impacting somebody else's ability to enjoy their rights, why do we care if they're happy because they took some psychoactive substance? Yeah, that's true. But Surely it's not just Puritanism that keeps politicians particularly from acting. I mean, you, you, you cite the numbers yourself. You say that, there is, that it's a, a, a covert, unstated goal of the war on drugs to arm up law enforcement. You say $35 billion a year spent on anti-drug uh, efforts. Actually, uh, um, the, the Cato Institute estimates around 48, 48 billion, so even more than you say. So. I mean, that, that would make just US anti-drug law enforcement something like the 11th biggest military spender in the world. So surely there are other interests, no? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I wasn't talking about the that sort of incentives, but you're absolutely right. Um, uh, the incentives that law enforcement has uh, for the continuation of the war on drugs is clear. You just nicely named those numbers. Um, but there are also incentives for the politicians from, from this respect, because what the war on drugs has act actually been, it's been a jobs program where jobs have left the U.S. to go to other countries for cheaper labor. The war on drugs has tried to fill in. And so you hire more cops, you hire more people to surveil your community. Uh, there are organizations that do like urine testing to see if they contain drugs. They are getting paid. Uh, treatment providers are getting paid. So a number of people are participating in this economy. Uh, and so that's why the war on drugs really stays with us. Uh, and so one of the things we have to do is to redirect the efforts of law enforcement or the pro or those uh, prohibitionists. We have to redirect them. Uh, if we don't, uh, we're going to stay with this war on drugs because it is worth so much money. And there are so many jobs tied to this. Mm. But do you see any way of that happening, considering that it is quite literally a physical force that is being armed up in the interest of maintaining the system? Well, we, if we can go back to the COVID-19 example that we opened up with, uh, when we think about COVID-19 and what opportunities that presents for us, not uh, the horrors that have happened because we know the horrors, but what kind of opportunities are there for us? Well, there are opportunities for new industries. Uh, for example, I've flown a couple of times in this pandemic era and the airports are, uh, they are immaculate. They are spotless. Uh, they have a, they've hired a number of people to do the cleaning uh, to make sure that uh, we are operating in the most uh, clean environment that we can. Uh, and so that's an opportunity to make sure that we hire people in those roles. Those are jobs. The same could be true with drugs. We can say we have people dying from overdoses. 
well, why not um, open up uh, these uh, drug checking facilities where you can submit uh, uh, anonymous, uh, anonymously uh, samples of your drug and get a chemical printout of everything that's contained in your drug. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can open up these type of facilities. We can also retrain police officers to help people stay safe, not arrest them, but they can, I mean, some police officers now carry uh, Narcan or naloxone to reverse overdoses, we can give them even better knowledge to help people stay safe. We can also think about this in terms of housing. Uh, we know that many of these accidents, accidental overdoses happen because people are injecting or using drugs in dangerous sort of environments where it's not sanitary, we can also push for uh, better housing for certain people. Um, and, and so there are opportunities here for us to serve our people better because what we have been doing certainly hasn't worked in terms of, in terms of drug overdose. It's in fact, drug overdose has just continued to increase. Um, and so if we really are serious about that, we would open up drug checking facilities uh, short of legally regulating substances of course that would be that would take care of this in a in in, in very rapidly um and and so i think that uh, it certainly can change if we really cared about our people and if the population was educated well enough hmm. right so essentially you're asking politics to sort out all the problems that so far they have been blaming on drugs as the origin uh, yeah, I, I, I am. Um, I'm asking, I'm, ax I'm actually asking the public to reconsider what they've been taught and what they've been told, because if the public gets this knowledge, I am certain that politicians will get it because we've seen it with uh, marijuana in the United States. We now have 16 states that have legalized marijuana not because politicians just got it all of a su sudden, uh, but because the people saw the tax revenue, the tax base that could be created as a result of selling marijuana um, and the jobs that were created as a result of legally regulating marijuana. And we can do the same thing with other substances. Um, as you will see, the marijuana sort of legalization will continue to spread in the United States. Heck, in Canada, they have said, well, we're going to legalize it nationwide, um, create more jobs, uh, also better product, uh, people can stay safe, uh, you don't have to be in the shadows with using these substances, and you can seek out information from uh, appropriate people, like certain healthcare professionals. I was actually going to ask you about the legalization of cannabis products, because Essentially, now, when you use it as an example, you are saying that the one force that can solve this is capitalism, because it gives people an incentive to make money off of substances that so far are being sold on a black or gray market. Which you yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm sorry, did I interrupt? I'm sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. No, you didn't. I interrupted you. But um, at the very beginning of our talk, you you said that it will this this cycle will continue as long as long as capitalism doesn't care about poor people i think correct me if that, I'm no you're absolutely right um right you know um i like to think that people would be moved to make a change because of the inhumane treatment um that we have demonstrated so towards drug users and drug dealers I would like to believe that we see the error in our ways, and that's why we change. But all of the evidence uh, suggests otherwise. We change because we see economic opportunity. That's the main reason that we change. Um, but me, as an idealist, um, um, as a humanitarian, um, I still hold on hope um, that people will change because they want to be decent because they want to be better humanitarians. Hmm. Do you see any tangible political change? I mean, you've been doing this sort of research for more than 25 years now, and uh, occasionally in your books, you mention particular administrations, but let's say uh, from just the changeover from the Trump to the Biden administration, perhaps too early, but that's in before maybe, did you ever see any meaningful change from one administration to the other in terms of their approach? 
I'm afraid not. You know, uh, Trump uh, was an awful president, uh, just in terms of um, dividing the population against each other. Uh, that's just and fanning the flames of hate. Um, and that's where I'm really focused on with Trump. And also the, the, the amount of dis misinformation and dishonesty uh, coming out of his White House was astonishing. Um, and, and that's just bad for the world. That's bad for any global citizen. Um, now, Joe Biden, you won't have um, that kind of dishonesty, um, just blatant lies. But he will have his problems when it comes to drugs. Uh, I don't think Trump and Biden will differ very much on policies. Um, we think we can think about Obama versus George Bush II versus Bill Clinton. The Democratic presidents have been equally bad on drugs. In fact, under Clinton, we really saw the prison population ri rise, and it continued under Bush. Two and under Bush uh, and under Obama. And so um, I don't see much of a difference between uh, these administrations when it comes to uh, drug policy. They both are, they're equally ignorant on drug policy. But what I am encouraged by uh, are some of the members of our Congress. Uh, I think of uh, Alexandria. Uh, Ocasio Cortez, she uh, AOC, she has um, uh, she has the right sort of perspective, um, and I have had the pleasure of speaking with some of these politicians, uh, people, um, and I don't really like speaking to politicians or their people, but uh, this younger group, they actually read. And they are um, they are curious about uh, these my perspective and other perspectives, and so I do have some hope for these younger politicians if we can just keep them in the game, and they are, that uh, we could just keep them here long enough and keep them uh, here so that they are not so discouraged that they leave politics. That's my main concern that they will become discouraged and leave politics. Mm. Perhaps as kind of a wrapping up question you talk a lot of obviously about the united states particularly but there is a tremendous amount of signaling power that comes out of u.s policy um let's say for 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 um our our readers our viewers from different countries is there any way that a single country can make a difference for a group larger than their own people in, in an interconnected world that is governed by by the UN single declaration on narcotic drugs and those sorts of things? Of course. I mean, the United States, we have exported our awful drug policies around the globe and we influence the drug policy of other countries because we have in the past withheld aid to certain countries who move, for example, to decriminalize all drugs. In 2006, I believe Mexico move to decriminalize all drugs and the United States withheld uh, aid to that country. And we, we do this, we exert our influence on their policies by withholding aid. And so, yes, what happens in the United States uh, is critical to uh, how other countries decide to regulate drugs. Um, you know, one of the things that um, has been encouraging even though certain countries don't have drug legal regulations or they don't have decriminalization, they are still not arresting large numbers of their population for drug violations. They are essentially uh, treating them like traffic violations. I mean, a number of us exceed the speed limit when we drive our cars sometimes. But imagine if everybody, every time someone exceeded the speed limit, they were pulled over by a police officer. That would be just so inefficient. And so many of these countries are treating uh, drug violations like uh, a, a speeding ticket or a traffic violation. Mm. Then in turn, considering that history of the United States intervening abroad, in cases of uh, you know countries taking their own way uh, in terms of drugs does should we all lobby the us or should we try to lobby for change in our own countries 
I think people should lobby for change in their own country. And they should uh, see, uh, because they know the issues in their country a lot better than people outside of their country. And, and then um, they will see where their government stand and they will see where the pressure points need to be applied. Um, for example, like the Mexico example I gave, um, Mexico decided to change their drug policy and then they had this aid from the US uh, withheld. So now you can make an argument that the U.S. is trying to influence local policy, which is inappropriate. And so you can highlight this and bring this to the global community to show the inappropriateness of the U.S.'s influence. Hmm. Right. A final question. The timing of your book seems kind of prodigious, your latest book just now. Um, what, was it influenced in any way by, by, the, by very recent events? I'm not talking about the pandemic, I'm talking more about uh, last year's events surrounding the death of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter, defund the police, those sorts of things. No, as you, uh, you may know, my book was done, uh, it was completed by February 2000. Uh, and we, would, we held up the publication because of the American presidential election, mm. uh, which was in November of 2020. But the book was completed long before the, the events of the summer of 2020 with George Floyd. But one of the things that is clear is that these, the issues that I describe in the book are very relevant because they're the same issues that happened in the summer of 2020. Um, and that uh, that just speaks to the power of the book and, and to um, the enduring power of these uh, the racial discrimination that we have in law enforcement when it comes to enforcing drug laws uh, is but one of those things. Right. Oh, it was certainly very prophetic in that sense. Um, I have to renege on saying that that was the last question. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, what in your opinion are the actual dangers of drug use? Mm. Yeah, um, so that's a big question. That's like saying- Feel free what, to cut No, off. no, it's a great question. I mean, because then it gives us a chance to talk about a lot of things. It's a great, it's a big question. Um, but I just want to make it clear that people understand that it's analogous to asking what, in your opinion, are the dangers of driving an automobile? Well, the dangers, of course, is that you don't want somebody to have an overdose. Um, and so there are um, uh, there are myriad ways of making sure that doesn't happen. Uh, you make sure that people understand about dosing. Uh, you make sure that people understand that um, what chemical, what substance they are actually taking. They, so they have to be informed about that. Um, you have to make sure that they're in a comfortable setting and in a supportive environment. Um, make sure that they have the skills, that they understand um, how to use a drug, um, understand something about their experience with the drug. If they are an experienced user, um, then it's more likely that they know a number of these things. But if they're not, make sure there's somebody with the person who understands and has more experience. So we think about uh, the dangers of drug use uh, in the same way we think about the dangers of something like automobile uh, driving or sexual inter inter intercourse, the same sort of way. These activities can be pleasurable, but they can also be dangerous if appropriate steps are not taken to enhance the safety. Hmm. Right. I mean, in that sense, it does connect again to the pandemic, even though it didn't seem to too much, because it has certainly rattled a lot of people's perceptions about policy and safety and individual behavior, in my I, opinion, at least. Yes. Uh, I guess I'm not. Uh, in our country, we, we are we behave in a way that we haven't learned many lessons from the pandemic. So uh, maybe in your country, you've learned more lessons. And um, we are still uh, arguing in my country about whether or not the pandemic or the COVID-19 uh, virus is, is actually a real thing. Uh, we are having those low level stupid conversations in my country. Right. I don't think it's very different, honestly, internationally. And people don't like when you tell them what to do. Um, strange that it seems to be different for drugs. Yes, that, that's exactly right. Uh, 
you know, um, people have said, for example, because in the new book, I talk about liberty. Mm -hmm. People should have liberty, of course, and that's what we promise people in the United States. And then they people say, well, I have my liberty allows me not to be vaccinated, not to wear a mask. And so therefore, um, that's my liberty, right? And that's what you're arguing with drugs. No, I'm not. Uh, when I think of um, a, a virus that can be passed along airborne uh, or however it's passed, it, you can be infected by interacting with someone. Mm -hmm. um, so it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure we protect ourselves and protect others. Um, whereas with drugs, you, if you're using drugs in the safety of your own place or in your own space, you're not impacting other, others' ability to enjoy their liberty. But in the case of not wearing a mask, in the case of not being vaccinated, then you are uh, you potentially impacting other people's uh, liberty. And we, we, uh, we don't have the right to impact other people's liberty, certainly not negatively. That's a very nice final sentence to wrap it up. Thank you so much, Professor Karl Hart, for talking to us. Um, tremendous book out now. I can only encourage everyone to go check it out. Um, and hopefully we will talk to you again in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me and uh, good luck.